A'udhu billahi bin ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wa al-mursaleen. Naybiyyana wa sayyidana Abu al-Qasim al-Muhammad. Wa ala ahli bayti al-tayyibin al-tahirin al-mazlumin al-ma'asumin. Wa la'natullah ala da'ahim ajma'in min al-an ila qiyam yawm al-deen. Ameen ya Rabb al-Alameen. Dear respected viewers, thank you for joining me once more live from the holy city of Karbala. In the background, as usual, we have the shrine and the blessed maqam of our master, Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. And you're joining me, Yahya Seymour, for this show, Back to the Basics. For those of you who may be tuning in for the first time, and indeed for those of you who may be tuning in again, Back to the Basics is that show in which we will be discussing several of the misconceptions pertaining to the original Islam, the Islam as was revealed to the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and as was espoused, articulated, and taught by the Ahlul Bayt, the holy Imams from the progeny of the Prophet Muhammad, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them all. In the previous three episodes, we have discussed roughly several of the challenges that we as Muslims living in the West, living in largely non-Muslim societies, fully integrated and in an era of globalization, have to face on a regular basis. Of course, these challenges, just because we live in non-Muslim lands, might not necessarily come from non-Muslims. And indeed, many of the challenges that we as a Shia community face are actually challenges which are raised by people that likewise call themselves Muslims and are Muslims in a minority society for Muslims. So we face that trouble of being that minority, that persecuted minority in the West, but on top of that, we face that problem of not even having solidarity with the rest of the Muslims because there's this attitude of the fact that we're Shia, we're not real Muslims as well. So in discussing some of these objections, some of these issues and some of these challenges which arise, I've stated that we need to have a precise way and method to engage with some of these doubts. These doubts, of course, are normally very, very basic and normally very challenges which pertain to just very small isolated issues pertaining to our theology, our jurisprudence, and also our ethical values. In order to engage with some of these doubts, I have proposed that as opposed to engaging with each doubt individually and each doubt as a separate far'i or branched out issue, that we go back to the very root of the problem. That in, as opposed to looking at each individual issue as a small issue which must be addressed and actualized, instead we look at our belief systems as packages of belief. That is to say, we look at things accordingly, that we're not just comparing one isolated belief against another isolated belief, but rather we compare the entire package. Because if the entire package makes sense, even if there's an issue that I can't actually rationalize, then that issue would not be a massive issue for us because we have those building bunkers in which we can trust the entire package. Likewise, if I have a belief that makes sense, but I have an entire package which makes no sense, we can't really trust that entire package because of that one isolated belief because the entire package makes no sense. In the past couple of episodes, I've been discussing the necessity and the real need to create a methodology for studying our religion, literally to go back to the basics. And to go back to the basics is to understand what is a religion? What is the way that we should be looking at religion? In last night's episode, I proposed that we go back to the basics and we recognize something about religion, which is that a religion is in reality what we call a world view. And I stated that a worldview is an interconnected set of beliefs which shapes how we view ourselves, how we view the universe, and also how we engage with ourselves in the universe. So it's an interconnected set of beliefs pertaining to man, God, and the universe. Given that, the first question we need to be asking ourselves, which I've highlighted, is of the utmost importance in any discussion, is what do I need in order to even consider, contemplate, and discuss issues of religion, discuss issues of worldview, and to think of those bigger questions such as, what is my relationship to the universe? What is the nature of man? And is man good or by 
definition evil or maybe a bit of both what is the nature of God what is my relationship with God and what is my future in order to discuss and to even contemplate all these questions there are several things I would need one of the things I would need certainly is the existence of a language but most importantly the very thing which allows me to understand and engage with that language is my intellect and I've stated in the previous episodes that without that intellect and without that ability to trust the intellect, we would be able to get nowhere in such discussions. To such a degree that these discussions would become entirely fruitless. Yesterday I struck the analogy, one which I believe that many of us living in the capital cities of the Western world can relate to. The analogy in which we come across a homeless, drug abusive, or either entirely drunk on alcohol type individual who comes out and maybe life has not placed him in the best of circumstances but he comes out to us and he says to us that reality is all an illusion that everybody's got it wrong that it's all a giant conspiracy that nobody really knows the truth and we can't trust our senses other than this man who has come to understand the truth he presents an image of a matrix like existence in which we can't really trust anything around us. How do we engage with such an individual? What would be our reaction to his claim? I have proposed that such an individual could never be taken seriously because the only way we're able to interpret what he's telling us is through the very intellect we've been given. The only way for us to even understand this conversation occurring is that we can trust our minds. And as soon as someone tells you that you cannot trust your mind, then you should know that that worldview is not a very sustainable or sufficient worldview. I ended last night's show by quoting an argument which I myself have been quite profoundly influenced by, which was designed by a Christian philosopher of the 20th century and popular writer, a professor at I believe it was Oxford or Cambridge University, the one which, which university it was slips my mind at the moment, C.S. Lewis. He calls this the argument against naturalism. Naturalism, of course, being the main worldview of the naturalistic, materialistic atheists today. And he states that he could never believe in naturalism or atheism because of one thing. It undermines the very ability to trust scientific conclusions and to trust our very minds. His argument goes as thus. This is cited from his book, Miracles. Thus, a strict materialism refutes itself for the reason given long ago by Professor Haldane, who states, if my mental processes are determined wholly by the motions of atoms in my brain, I have no reason to suppose that my beliefs are true, and hence I have no reason for supposing my brain to be composed of atoms. Essentially, his argument is as thus. If materialistic, naturalistic atheism is true, then our brains are merely a composite of matter and atoms which move about and cause our thought processes. They're entirely accidental. They're not rationally driven, rather they're driven physically by the movement of motions in our brains. And if our brains are merely physical matter in motion, with no real thought process going on, because what is the concept of a thought in an entirely materialistic world? Then the thought or the intellectual conclusion that atheism is true must be wrong, because if it is true, then even reaching that conclusion as a mental process and as an intellectual decision would be impossible, because at the end of the day, you're not really choosing to make that choice. So it's more like a can of soda just fizzing over, and that's the conclusion of it. There's no thought process involved, rather there's only a physical process. The point I'm trying to make here, and the point which was made by this professor, C.S. Lewis, is that he can never trust atheism because it entirely undermines the intellect. Likewise, you have several other quotes from numerous profound atheists which undermine the ability to reason. Allow me to quote a professor of the philosophy of science, Patricia Churchland, who states the following, about the consequences of her belief in Darwinian evolution. She states, boiled down to essentials, a nervous system enables the organism to succeed in the four Fs. Forgive me, dear viewers, she named them the four Fs. I did not name them as such, but they are feeding, fleeing, fighting, and reproducing. 
the principal chore of nervous systems is to get the body parts where they should be in order that the organism may survive. Improvements in sensory motor control confer an evolutionary advantage. A fancier style of representing is advantageous so long as it is geared to the organism's way of life and enhances the organism's chances of survival. She states, however, truth, whatever that is, definitely takes the hindmost. So her argument is as false. Because we have evolved from a lower species, evolution is concerned with survival of the fittest. And yet, according to her, the fittest would be concerned with only four Fs. Fee fighting, feeding, fleeing, and reproduction. Anything beyond these four Fs, such as rational deduction, discovering truth, is not the concern of the evolutionary cycle. And therefore, because our mind has been crafted by the evolutionary cycle and concerned only with the evolutionary cycle, she believes that truth is not a concern or something that the human mind is directed towards. And of course, this heavily undermines our ability to trust our reasoning processes. Likewise, Charles Darwin, the very person who became famous for expounding and teaching the doctrine or the belief the scientific theory of Darwinian evolution, he states the following. With me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the conviction of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? So Charles Darwin also specifically states that when it comes to the ability to trust the human reasoning process, it's heavily undermined by his theory. Because at the end of the day, if we're saying that we are merely people that have evolved in a cycle from lower species, and we are distant cousins of a monkey, then we don't really place much stock in the intellectual reasoning capabilities of a monkey. And therefore, again, this is another worldview which would undermine and completely destroy one's ability to reason. It's like the child that sits in the lap of his father in order to be able to slap the father. In order to do so, you need to sit on your father's lap. But then if you say that I don't believe my father exists, this is exactly what you're doing. So these very individuals, they come up with a theory, a theory which undermines the intellect, but they want to convince you of that theory rationally. What we're trying to say here is any theory, any worldview which does not respect the intellect is one which must be rejected. And this is entirely what we've been trying to reason over the past two episodes. So what is the position of the Imamiyyah? What is the position of the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt salam, when it comes to the human ability to reason and whether or not we can trust our reasoning skills? This is very important for our dialogue with those other schools of thought because it becomes a key point in whether or not we can take any other worldview other than the Imami Shi'i worldview seriously. Imam al Sadiq, alayhi salatu was salam, when asked to define the aql, he states about the aql, ma abda bihi al Rahman wa aktasaba bihi al Jannan, that the intellect is that by which Allah Azzawajal is worshipped and that by which the gardens of paradise are acquired. Now, of course, when he said that the gardens of paradise are acquired, what he means is that through this worship, which of course the aql facilitates, we will of course be able to enter Jannah. So this is the important and high status given to the intellect by the sixth infallible Imam, Imam Sadiq. Furthermore, he is also, it has also been stated by the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi إِذَا رَعَيْتُمْ رَجُلْ كَثِيرَ الصَّلَاةِ كَثِيرَ الصِّيَامِ فَلَا تَبَاهُ بِهِ حَتَّى تَنْظُرُ كَيْفَ أَقْلِهِ If you see a man who prays heavily, who fasts often, then don't, consider, don't be impressed with such an individual until you test the reasoning of his aql. So this is the status given to the aql by the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by the sixth Imam. May Allah's peace and blessings be upon all the Imams and the Holy Prophets. In fact, when you come to one of the most important books of the Shia, of course, which is the book Usul Al-Kafi, 
of Thuqat al-Islam Muhammad bin Ya'qub al-Kulayni, a very important work and a work which probably has the main status of being the most primary source of traditions for our madhab and for our religion. This particular work, when you look at the chapters involved in the divisions of the chapters of hadith, which were compiled by the great muhaddith Muhammad bin Ya'qub al-Kulayni al-Razi, may Allah's pleasure be with him and may he be elevated in his status, we see that some of the earliest chapters involved in the book are all to do with the creation of the intellect and its opposition to ignorance. In Al-Kafi, it is narrated from Muhammad bin Muslim, from Abi Ja'far alayhi salam. Abi Ja'far, of course, is Imam al-Baqir alayhi salatu salam, the fifth holy imam. He states, when Allah created the intellect, he gave it the ability to speak. Then he said to it, draw near, and so it drew near. Then he said to it, turn back, and so it turned back. And then he said to it, by my might and majesty, I have not created a creature more beloved to me than you. And I will not perfect you except in the one I love. You do I command, and you do I prohibit. You do I punish, and you do I reward. So we see that Allah Azawajal states that the most beloved of his creation are endowed with the intellectual capability and are endowed with this intellect. The intellect is therefore something which has given a very, very high status according to our Imams. Imam al Riva alayhi salatu wasalam states, that the friend of every man is his intellect and his enemy is his ignorance. So Allah Azza wa Jal and the holy Imams who of course are the spoken emissaries of Allah on the face of the earth who convey to us the truths about reality, science, religion and what have you have all stated very firmly that we are to indeed trust our intellects. We have a very interesting narration in which one of the companions states to the Imam, he states to him, I said to Abil Hassan alayhi salam, we have a group who love you and profess a love towards you and they do not have a firm resolve in this, although they profess to shayu. The Imam says, these are not those who were admonished by Allah when Allah said, so give heed, O possessors of insight. So again, the Imam is admonishing such individuals because they're not people that utilize their intellects. The Imam also states, this is of course Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam, as is related in Rijal al-Kishi, my companions are the people of discernment, that is to say people who discern rationally, again use their rationality and God consciousness. Whoever is not from the people of discernment and God consciousness, then he is not from my companions. So we see, not only do the Imams place a heavy stress on the refinement and purified stature of the intellect, but they've also said that whoever does not use this intellect to discern between truth and falsehood, then such a person is of course not of their companions. Abi Hashim al-Jafari narrates that we were with Imam al-Riva alayhi salatu wasalam when he began discussing intellect and moral virtue. So he said, O oh Abu Hashim, intellect is a free gift from Allah, while virtue is an effortful acquisition. Whoever strives to acquire virtue is able to possess it, but whoever scribe, strives to acquire intellect, he achieves not that except further ignorance. So we see that the Imams have clearly stated that the intellect is a gift. Therefore, in understanding such, we now understand that when the intellect guides towards something, then this is what the truth is. And our religion is one which respects the role of the intellect. It does not undermine it in any way and tell you that, look, you can't trust your intellect. Because at the end of the day, the intellect is the very thing which every human being is born with. And it's the only real means that every human being has in order to discern the truth. Think to yourselves of those hypothetical analogies that most theologians have come up with, in which a man is born on a desert island and does not have access to revelation. Indeed, with our particular understanding of Islam, the true and original Islam of Ali Muhammad salam, the intellect is something that we could say is one of the only guides because we, we notice that our community is particularly lacking in bringing the message to others. And therefore, 
when we fail to do so, when we fail to bring them to the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt, how would we expect such individuals to be guided? At the very least, they need to have some form of guide that will testify against themselves and be able to act as a hujjah upon them on the Day of Judgment. And of course, that guide would be the intellect. The intellect is something that Allah Azza wa has given to every human being, regardless of where they are born. And that intellect is something that we hold, have to hold on to very dearly. If anyone is to tell you that we should not trust our intellect, then we know that such a worldview is a deficient worldview. And I want you all to bear that in mind over the next few nights, because we will see the very process of what I call philosophically beheading your own self by arguing in favor of a religion, only to therefore undermine the role of the intellect and say that we can't trust this intellect whatsoever. That is the, that is the first alarm bell and key explanation mark that we need to see in order to know that a, a particular worldview is one that has to be rejected. So in light of this, in light of the fact that we can all trust our intellects, we see that with Shiism in particular, this heavy emphasis on the intellect is one that must be taken pride in and one which must be understood and distinctly admitted and kind of put forward to the discussion table. So whenever anyone wants to reduce a discussion with you to a textual one, reject this immediately. Because we're not blind textualists. We're people that have been endowed with an intellect and our Imams have approved the intellect as a distinct source of knowledge. Giving this primary seat of the intellect allows one to engage in any discussion with anyone. Because if you can trust this intellect which Allah Azza wa has given us all, then certainly we can trust our minds to be able to discern between truth and falsehoods. But those who claim that they can't trust the intellect, people like Patricia Churchland, people like Charles Darwin, those who have stated that the intellect cannot be trusted, what are the consequences of such a claim? Surely in claiming such, they have basically undermined any ability to have any discussion whatsoever. Now, as we shall see in the next few nights, inshallah ta'ala, it is not merely Charles Darwin, it is not merely Patricia Churchland who have undermined this ability. There are certain schools in Islam where likewise they would have you believe that you cannot truly understand things of a religion, that you cannot trust your intellect to discern between truth and falsehood when it comes to religious doctrines. Note, I'm stating clearly that there's a difference between doctrines and jurisprudence. No one is claiming, no one is claiming that we can trust our intellects for discerning jurisprudence. But when it comes to doctrines, we need to know whether or not we can trust our intellects. Now, for those of you that want to claim that no, we don't trust our intellects, we trust the Quran and the Sunnah. What about those who were not born onto the, onto the Quran and the Sunnah? What about those who were not born into a religion which follows your kitab and your sunnah? What about those who now have come to Islam and want to understand what is the real understanding of the kitab and the sunnah? Are you going to tell them what my scholars say? Are you going to undermine the intellect of someone that has made this search, made this journey, and try to hijack that beautiful mind of theirs, that intellect that Allah Azza wa has given them, and try to say that, look, I'm going to go with the ijma of my scholars, I'm going to go with the ijma of my scholars and I don't respect your intellect because you're a limited human being. Why didn't you treat them that way when they were coming out of religion that they were following previously? Why didn't you tell them that, you know what, you don't need to trust your intellect, stick with Hinduism, for example, or stick with Christianity. But now that they're a Muslim, they don't trust their intellects whatsoever. These are all key questions that we're going to be asking over the next few nights because it is of the most important topic that we understand all of this, that we understand that the intellect has a very key role in everything to do with religion. Brothers and sisters, I apologize for tediously talking about this same issue, but it's key for us to understand in order to understand this discussion. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.